So I think we make a start. It's just after 12 o'clock now in Adelaide. There might still be more people coming in to join us. So hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Heidi. I'm one of the postgrad representatives of the MEM thematic group. So we've got lots of acronyms. So MEM stands for Migration, Ethnicity and Multiculturalism. We're one of the thematic groups um, at TASA. TASA stands for the Australian Sociological Association. Um, and before I say much more, we are of course all uh, meeting online, but at least for our speakers today and for myself, we are based in Adelaide. So I would like to acknowledge that for us, the land that we meet on today is the traditional lands of the Ghana people and that we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. And we also acknowledge the Ghana people as the traditional custodians of the Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Ghana people today. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the rest of the organizing team. So there were five of us organizing this event and organizing this whole series. Um, so I also acknowledge Yora, Charlie, Yingwa and Sarah, thank you so much for your work and for helping um, organize this event. Um, and yes, again, welcome to this session. Thank you for joining us. We had almost 60 people signing up and actually as we speak, I'm still getting emails with people registering um, via the Eventbrite page. So I'm trying to multitask and still send out the Zoom links to everyone. Um, and we're really excited that you are joining us. I know those times are very stressful and very challenging. So we really appreciate that you're joining us and that we um, can still talk about our research um, and, and that we can continue to connect and have those um, really important conversations. For this um, first event in our series of um, online events, we have partnered with MARNET. Um, so here's another acronym. So MARNET is the Migration and Refugee Research Network in Adelaide. They have this event with us. And Dr. Melanie Bark, who's one of our speakers today as well, is the convener for MARNET and she will give us a short message and a short welcome on behalf of Marnet as well. So I hand over to you, Mel. Thanks, Heidi. I feel like I should say good morning, good afternoon, good evening and good night. We seem to be scattered across a range of time zones. So welcome and great to have people from across the world joining us. So um, thanks everyone and thanks Heidi and your team for your work in organising this under trying circumstances, I suppose. In a way, it's been a little bit of a plus because it was going to be an Adelaide based event and we probably would have got the usual Adelaide crowd, but um, this is enabling us to reach out internationally. So trying to find plus sides in these challenging moments is, is I think, positive. Um, so I am one of the co-conveners of the Migration and Refugee Research Network, which was originally established at the University of South Australia, but we wanted to try and do something that seems to be somewhat challenging which is bringing together the three South Australian based universities um, to act in one body. Uh, so we've created this organisation that sits across UniSA, Flinders University and Adelaide University with a focus on migration and refugee related research. So the other co-conveners are um, Professor Alex Riley and Associate Professor Anna Ziyech. And we look to have regular um, kind of events to explore these different kinds of issues around migration and refugee related issues. So we're excited at the possibility of, of partnering with Heidi and the MEM TASER team um, to bring this event to you. So thanks Heidi. Thank you, Mel, and thanks for supporting this event. Um, I'll say a few um, housekeeping things and then I'll introduce our speakers for today. So um, this is a short reminder that we are recording this session. So there's lots of people who were keen to join us but weren't able to join us. Um, as Mel mentioned, we're all over the world in different time zones. So we are recording this event and we'll make the recording available to everyone um, afterwards. Um, while we have our presentations, I would like everyone to mute, uh, mute their microphones and I think pretty much everyone is muted. Yeah, perfect. I think we're all Zoom experts already, but it would be awesome if you can leave your cameras on if you're comfortable because I think it's just so nice to see everyone's face um, and for the speakers to at least get some nods and some smiles while they're speaking. Um, I think it makes it all a little bit less weird and a little bit less uncomfortable. Um, we will have um, only, unfortunately, two speakers out of three speakers. So we've got Dr. Melanie Bark and Dr. David Radford. Unfortunately, Dr. Clement Stew, um, at short notice, wasn't able to join us because she's got a sick family member. 
But I think we still have um, very exciting speakers with Melanie and with David. So each of them will speak for 20 to 30 minutes. Um, and then after that, we will have a Q&A session um, where you can ask all your questions. So both of them will speak first and then at the very end, we will have some questions. So please hold on to your questions and then I'll explain afterwards how we run the Q&A part. Um, we also um, encourage you to use Twitter. So we've got two Twitter handles. We've got hashtag nextgenmem and we've got hashtag conversations about. Um, so feel free to use them. I'll say them once more. So it's hashtag nextgenmem and hashtag conversations about. So feel free to um, use those if, if you are on Twitter. Um, so I will introduce our speakers. We will have Dr. Melanie Bach, who will speak first, and then Dr. David Radford will be our second speaker. Um, so Melanie is a research fellow and lecturer in the School of Education at UniSA, and as she said herself just before, a co-convener of the Migration and Refugee Research Network, MARNET. In recent research projects, she has collaborated with refugee background communities to explore areas including belonging, education, and employment, and she's currently a chief investigator on an ARC linkage project, exploring how schools foster refugee student resilience. Her book, Negotiating Belonging, Stories of Forced Migration of Finca Women from South Sudan, was published by Sense in 2016, and it considers how forced migration shapes experiences of belonging. Melanie was awarded an Endeavour Research Fellowship to the University of Glasgow in 2017, where she researched schools as sites of resettlement for Syrian refugees. And Melanie has had diverse roles in community development, education, and research. Oh my God. Yes, <laughs> with um, uh, refugee background communities over the past 16 years. Um, and our second speaker, Dr. David Redford, is a senior lecturer in sociology at UniSA. And David researches and publishes widely on the challenges and opportunities of rural migration, especially concerning refugee background and non European migrants. David is currently investigating the positive social, cultural and economic contributions of refugee background migrants to local communities. Publications include Space, Place and Identity, Intercultural Encounters, Effect and Belonging in Rural Australian Spaces, which was published in 2017 in the Journal of Intercultural Studies and Everyday Otherness, Intercultural Refugee Encounters and Everyday Multiculturalism in a Rural South Australia Town, published in 2016 in the Journal of Ethnic and migration studies. So I'll be really keen to see if we can very briefly all unmute ourselves and have a round of applause to welcome our speakers. I'll start. <laughs> Boom! <Cool. laughs> all right, so yes, thank you to our speakers and I will hand over to Mel. Um, and we'll, we didn't do a test before, but you should be able to share your screen. All right, I think I'm getting there. <laughs> Slideshow from beginning. Is that working for you all? Bright yellow on your screens? Yes, some nods and thumbs up. Excellent, beautiful. So as Heidi mentioned, we were really hoping that um, Dr. Clemmy Jew would be joining us today. And Clemmy and I have worked together on a range of projects and uh, she br brings a wealth of expertise um, sitting on some panels, including uh, the Women's and Children's Health, um, SA Health, network uh, research ethics panel. Um, so bringing that perspective, I think sitting on some of these ethics panels and also Clemmy um, works in sort of health psychology. So moves that line between um, health ethics and the more social sciences ethics. And Clemmy had been planning to talk a little bit more about the um, National Health and Medical Research Council guidelines around research um, and those kind of formal guidelines that I guess are in place um, and the ethics committees that enable us to either get our research across the mark in terms of getting into the field um, and, and not. So she was going to set the scene with talking about some of that and then I was going to talk a bit more about the practical elements. I'm going to try and add in a little bit more um, just off the cuff to fill in some of that what I refer to as more procedural ethics as well. So um, oh, I don't know, I can't move my slides. 
what am I doing wrong? Oh, there we go. All right, so um, this table I think is really helpful in thinking through different um, elements of ethics and questions that we ask ourselves about ethical approaches to our research. And I was originally going to focus more on this micro individual kind of level of research in my presentation today. Those kinds of questions around um, whether research impinges on individuals' right to privacy, could my research affect um, or offend subjects in any ways, and the sorts of emotional distress. And I know the kind of procedural ethics that we embark on does get us to um, ask ourselves these more micro level questions. But I think often these procedural ethics committees are much more focused on these meso and macro levels of ethics as well. Um, so I identify um, kind of these two levels in particular, what has been referred to as macro ethics, um, which is the sort of ethics of ethics committees and procedural ethics, um, and then these more micro ethics or the ethics in practice. Um, so a really useful article that I have found in this space is by um, Gilliman and Gillam, which is ethics, reflexivity, and ethically important moments in research. And it's, it's a 2004 article, so 16 years old now, but I think nonetheless very useful in this space as we think both about the procedural and the macro ethics, but then also what this means in practice once we are out in the field. So I think for many of us working in the space, uh, anything particularly around refugees, asylum seekers, um, or culturally and linguistically diverse populations, often these groups are seen by formal procedural ethics committees as quite vulnerable groups. Um, and I draw on some research that was published quite recently by Johnson, Harrison and Ollis, and they had um, an ARC project looking at um, or researching sexuality education or, and sex education in um, South Australian, no, sorry, Australian schools, two different states. And this recent article called Resisting Ethics Over Regulation in Research into Sexuality and Relationships Education, Insights from an Australian Study, they argue that there are um, three kind of challenges with ethics review boards. One is that they overemphasize the vulnerability of young research persistent participants, sorry, and make exaggerated assessments of that risk. Second is that they evaluate all research from a biomedical perspective that discounts research approaches that are based on different epistemolog epistemologies, such as the social sciences. And thirdly, that they use bureaucratic and adversarial ways to resolve contested research ethics issues. So they go on to explore um, those sorts of questions that we so often get back from research um, ethics committees of why are you doing this? Have you thought about that? Um, the assumptions that are made about risk of particular populations. So I would add to their first point around the vulnerability of young research participants that very often this is any sort of marginalised population, whether refugees, asylum seekers, or culturally and linguistically diverse. And as an example of that, um, a recent research project that I've been undertaking, I asked for an amendment to ethics um, to give out um, vouchers. I'd already pre-bought Coles Meyer vouchers for a first phase of the study with African-Australian um, employment seekers in South Australia. And it, it was approved for the first phase of the study, which was focus groups. And then I went to amend my ethics um, approval so that I could use the leftover vouchers uh, to give out to those who participated in an online survey in a kind of random draw. Um, and the research committee response to that was um, that, have you thought about how this vulnerable group may not be able to access public uh, access transport and get to Coles and Meyer and you're limiting their options and a very negative and deficit view of the African Australian population. And so I wrote back and challenged that and said, these are actually professional African Australians that I am engaging with. I find your deficit assumptions that they wouldn't be able to access transport and get to these locations. Um, quite unnecessary and they, they did allow me to get that through and, and were quite considerate in their response. Um, but I think it's interesting, at UniSA we've had a recent change to the ethics committee head um, to someone from within education, so with a much more social sciences background and someone who works in kind of trying to reject deficit views of young children. And I found that that has led to a change in the way the ethics committee as a whole is now perceiving so-called vulnerable populations as well. So thinking about who is on our ethics committee um, or ethics committees is really useful, but oftentimes we don't know that or have access to it. 
And it is good to see a shift from um, what Johnson and colleagues referred to as that kind of biomedical perspective um, in some ethics committees to more acknowledgement of some of the, the human and social sciences as well. So I'll move, that's sort of all I wanted to talk to you about the sort of procedural ethics element. And I, I certainly can't feel Clemming's shoes in that space. Um, but I wanted to talk more about this kind of microethics or the ethics in practice. Um, so Gilman and Gillam say that responsibility falls back to the researchers themselves through this kind of ethics in practice as ultimately we as the researchers in the field are the ones who conduct, um, whose conduct the actual ethical research depends. So they talk about this idea of ethically important moments in doing research, which is the difficult, often subtle, and usually unpredictable situations that can arise in the practice of doing research. And I want to reflect on the, some of those with some um, case studies from a couple of research projects that I have been involved in. One of the key aspects that Gilliman and Gillam talk about um, in relation to ethical research practice is that we need a way of thinking that actually leads to this kind of ethical research practice. And they argue that reflexivity um, is a really important role in this space. So they suggest that being reflexive um, means acknowledging the kind of microethics, the ethical dimension of ordinary everyday research practice, being sensitive to ethically important moments in research practice, and being able to address and respond to ethical concerns if and when they arise in the research process. So this is something we're engaging in in the very moment of being out in the field or engaged in a, an interview or a focus group or whatever it may be. It's those little decisions we make about um, whether we ask the next question is going to push a certain participant too far. Um, it's reflecting on how our involvement with our participants is impacting emotionally on ourselves and our own life experiences. So this idea of reflexivity, I think, is, is critical to what it means to do research ethically with people from refugee and migrant backgrounds. Another element of, of reflexivity and ethics and research in general, I think, is an acknowledgement of power and how this has implications for our ethical relationships in research. So ethics in research is always underscored by the identification of power imbalances between the researcher and participants. And there's been all sorts of ways of looking at this from um, perspectives around insider and outsider research. Um, I argued in, in my PhD and subsequent book that we have a kind of continuum of insider-outsider perspective for those of, of us who have worked in the refugee resettlement space, for example. We have an element of insider information, but we're not people necessarily that have had a lived experience as a refugee. So we have a kind of continuum and, and we're always negotiating in different moments where we lie along this continuum. So, uh, for example, my PhD was with Dinka women from South Sudan, and I'm married into the Dinka community. Um, so how I'm perceived as, as from different members of the community at different times moves backwards and forwards along this, this kind of continuum of being insider or outsider. And similarly, I think, you know, the, the ways in which power works within a research relationship at some moments, um, you know, you as the researcher have a very high level of power in, in comparison to your participants, but that shifts and changes depending on context and, and what's going on in the research at the time. So within this context of empowered, entangled power relations, research ethics that are deployed in collaborative methodologies need to be relational and contextual, a product of reciprocity between researchers and researched and negotiated in practice. So it's a continually negotiated, um, I guess, attempt to share and recognise the way power is working within that research relationship. So I want to talk a little bit about three particular projects today. I had um, lots of different examples from different research, but I, I think these three um, speak to some different elements that I'd like to highlight today. So the first one is my PhD research, um, which was called Negotiating Belongings, The Haunted Journeys of Jia Zheng, which um, has subsequently turned into the book that Heidi spoke about. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, then the second project is improving educational outcomes for students from refugee backgrounds in the South Australian Certificate of Education. And I'll highlight a couple of those kind of ethical moments and, and contributions, I think, of that project. 
And the final project is um, one that I undertook while on an Endeavour Fellowship at the University of Glasgow, uh, which is engaging Syrian background students and families in schooling. And some of these, I think, are, uh, you know, I think they're all examples of that reflexivity, researcher reflexivity in practice. Um, some of them, I think, maybe highlight what I would like to think are uh, elements of good practice, and some are certainly things that I have learned from um, and things that probably, not that they weren't ethical, but I think when, were limited by the certain confines um, in being perhaps as ethical as I would have liked them to be. Okay, so the first um, is my PhD research. As I said, this involved five Dinka women from South Sudan who had been resettled in South Australia um, in in-depth life story interviews. And I also used um, ethnographic and autoethnographic approaches in that research. I explored through the autoethnography auto auto um, my own position as a Dinka woman and wife as well. The other really interesting thing I think about this project was I had pre-existing friendships and relationships with the five women and those friendships and relationships have continued following the research as well. Um, and in light of that, I used what Tillman Healy has referred to as an ethic of friendship. Um, so this 2003 paper, I think, is really seminal in this space of, um, in a way, it's a kind of decolonial research methodology, as, as Linda Tuhiwai Smith has discussed. And it, it attempts to, I think, acknowledge those power relations um, and the ways in which they shift and change through this kind of ethic of care and ethic of friendship that's mutually beneficial. Um, so she says that this ethic of friendship seeks to undermine the potential for colonization and exploitation in research with power imbalances. The researcher must adopt a stance of hope, caring, justice, and even love, a level of investment in participants' lives that puts fieldwork relationship on par with the project. To do this, she suggests that we treat participants with respect, honour their stories and try to use their stories for humane and just purposes. So for me then, this meant really reflecting on my power in the field. And as I said, this kind of moved along these different levels of a continuum. So while in Australia, I had a degree of privilege as a white woman who's grown up in Australia and has knowledge of um, various systems and structures that the women were trying to negotiate, um, and I was able to use that knowledge to support them. So I never went into their homes just to retrieve their stories and come out and analyze them. Uh, I spent hours and hours drinking cups of tea, helping kids with homework, doing the dishes, uh, all, all manner of things, um, helping fill in forms. Um, and that kind of friendship that builds across a research relationship of this sort. Now I recognize that being a PhD um, the sort of data collection inherent in being able to do a PhD over a longer period of time is quite different from uh, subsequent projects that I've now been involved with. So as I reflect back now on the PhD, I sort of see that as a privilege in being able to um, really spend the time to, to build and um, enable those friendships in much deeper ways than I've certainly had the opportunity to do in subsequent research projects. And in doing that, I think, um, I was able to experience what Bihar refers to as being a vulnerable observer, that kind of shared vulnerability. So the women were opening to me um, and telling me some very um, uh, rich, one of my supervisors referred to them as traumatic stories. I don't like to refer to them as stories of trauma because they're the, they're the stories of the women's life um, with the experience of challenge. Um, and nonetheless, they kind of made themselves vulnerable in particular ways. Um, but for me in turn, it was how can I be vulnerable and open myself to the women to also build that relationship um, that goes deeper than, you know, not the one-sided, uh, the, the participant gives all and the researcher gives nothing. It was a, a mutual kind of vulnerability. There was also this kind of need to account for cultural protocols, values and behaviours. So I, I drew a lot on the work of Linda Tehuay Smith. Um, and I think thankfully I had already been with the Dinka community for about 10 years. So I had spent a lot of time observing and, and trying to accommodate cultural or learn about, I should say rather, learn about the kinds of um, cultural expectations, particularly of me as a Dinka wife. So things like uh, often the women would prepare a meal either while I was there or prior to my arrival. 
And as a younger Dinka woman in the community by age and also by the number of children that I had, um, there was a cultural expectation that I would, after eating a meal, it was expected that I would do the dishes. And I knew that from you know, many years of working within the community. But had I gone in, um, eaten their food, taken their story and left, uh, it would have shut down the sort of further conversations that I went in and had with them subsequently. So learning about and working within those cultural protocols, I think, is, is really important. But you know, my location as a Dinka wife placed me very differently than had I just been um, a white Anglo-Australian researcher going into the home. So it wouldn't have been the same uh, assumption that I would do the dishes and things like that. So working out your position, but building that kind of um, knowledge about what's expected of you as a researcher and as a person, I think, more importantly in these contexts is really important. But then I think, you know, for me, the, the final consideration of power then is in this idea of conceiving of theorising and writing the research. And a lot of decolonial research approaches advocate that you do this in collaboration with your research participants. Now, this isn't something I did directly with the women. I think, you know, in a way, I did because I would interview them about their stories and I would um, go and write their narrative in, in the words that they'd used in their accounts. And then I'd take the story back to them um, as a kind of cross check where they could take stories out if they didn't, did or didn't want elements of it or um, add in things or elaborate on them. But I wouldn't say that I did and I wouldn't say that I could have done the conceiving of and theorising or writing of the research with the women. Ultimately, that was up to me to choose which parts of their story to include or not include. Um, the ways in which I theorised uh, were, you know, drawing on the body of literature that I had read. Um, and I think for me, it was very difficult to take that back to the women at that point. Um, so that, that was what I did in that instance. In that instance, sorry. And finally, I think, uh, you know, one decision that I did make that, that contributed to me thinking that I was, in a way, always foregrounding the best interests of the women in that was choosing my responsibilities to the women and the community over those that I had as a researcher. So even if the women told me a story that I thought, wow, that, that really tells us something unique, if I thought it might cause harm to the woman or to her, the community or to her family in the future, I wouldn't use that story. Um, as the harm to the woman in the community would be greater than the good it might contribute to the research. Um, so as an example of that, I just want to read a little section from my thesis. And this was a, with a woman called Nyanut. Um, and she had told me, uh, I had a very close pre-existing relationship with Nyanut. Um, and she had told me um, her story. I'd then written it and taken it back to her. And when reading the story back to her, um, as we neared completion of the end of the reading, uh, this conversation took place. And, and this is in Nyanut's um, language as well, in, in her English um, as well. So I said, is there any other thing you want to write or you want to take something away or change something? And Nyanut says, yes, I want to change something. And then she detailed what she wanted to change, which I didn't include in this transcript. Then she says to me, because I think we are the same together. We didn't secret anymore. You are a part of a fam our family. So I think that is I told you because you are one of my family that I went to, but this list does not stay with you. And I said, I clarified with her, we don't want to tell the other people, yeah? She says, maybe the one is getting this thing, maybe they need the different one who's wrote this life history to find you. This is maybe sometimes coming very different course. So she requested that I move a particular section of her story, which she had told me as a member of her family. She feared that if I included that, that section might have negative ramifications both for her and for me. Um, so even though it was a particularly interesting aspect of her story, I did remove it um, and any traces of it as I did with some other sections of the women's stories, even bits that they hadn't necessarily asked me to remove, but I used my own discretion to think that, that they might either identify the women um, or have um, potential negative ramifications for the community or for the women themselves. So I'll go now to thinking about the, the next project, which is a very, very different project. Um, nowhere near as personal, and there just wasn't the scope for the personal in this. 
Um, and this was a project that was co-funded by UniSA and Catholic Education in South Australia. Um, and we were exploring how um, two particular schools, two particular Catholic secondary schools with reasonable numbers of students from refugee backgrounds, were endeavouring to improve the outcomes for these students in the South Australian Certificate of Education, which is the final two years um, of schooling that results in a, an ATAR or an entrance score to get into university. So in this project, we did um, online surveys with staff and students at these two schools, then focus groups with the two groups, so um, staff at two schools and students at two schools separately. And then finally, we did some interviews with staff and students at the two schools as well. And I'd like to reflect on one particular moment. And I saw Emily Miller um, is on here and, and Emily was actually the wonderful research assistant on this project. And Emily, I hope you don't mind, I'm gonna recount a moment um, that we kind of experienced in this research. Um, so Emily was conducting some research with a student who became quite distressed uh, and didn't want her experiences particularly discussed with the school. Um, so Emily checked with the student as she was going if she was happy to continue with the interview and for the information to be included in the research, which the student was. And the information sheet, as per the kind of procedural ethical requirements of these things, required that we contain all of the contacts like Lifeline and um, all of the relevant support services for, that participants can contact if they feel distressed. Um, but we thought that probably the student wouldn't access these even though they were distressed. They, it was unlikely that they would utilise any of those supports from the information sheet. Um, so Emily and I discussed the interview and the student um, and we had one of those kind of critical ethical moments of where you know, the student has said, please don't discuss what I've said with the school. Um, but we knew that if something didn't happen, this student may not receive the, the support that she needed. Um, so what we decided was that um, the, there was one key teacher that we thought had the strongest relationship with this particular student and with most of the refugee background students at the school and seemed to be very knowledgeable about everything that was going on in the students' lives. We didn't breach the confidentiality of the student or discuss the content of the interview in any way, but just flagged that perhaps that student may have um, had some troubles and, and could she keep an eye on her really. Um, and the EALD teacher fed back that she was aware that that student had had a lot of difficulties and would just keep a, a, a confidential follow up, not necessarily discussing the research. Um, so I think that was an, an ethical, a moment where we had to make these kind of micro ethical decisions of where do we, what, what do we do? Do we just let the student go and know that they may be at risk? Um, do we intervene in more complex ways, say, you know, phoning um, or, or requiring that they phone some of the support services on the information sheet? Or do we try and keep it um, at a level that um, can be negotiated within the school? So, you know, that was a decision that we made in that moment. Um, and from what we understand that that student then went on to, to complete her year 12. And I think it, the other thing that this highlights is the ways in which this work really needs regular debriefs within research teams. And in this instance, Emily and I were lucky to have each other. We were both at the school at the same time and we could talk about this experience. But I think sometimes for PhD students, you might be out in the field on your own. Um, your supervisors may not necessarily be immediately contactable and you're making these decisions as people who are quite new to research um, and not necessarily knowing what the right thing to do is all the time. Um, but I think that degree of reflexivity and for me always putting the participants first, um, I think helps to make these ethical decisions a little bit easier. One of the other things that I wanted to highlight in this project is um, I guess some, some key questions that always guide me in my re research are um, from Linda, Linda Tuhuai Smith's book, Decolonizing Methodologies. And she specifically says these key questions are relevant to Indigenous research participants. Um, but I always try and reflect on them myself in any type of research that I'm doing. So she says that Indigenous research participants would be thinking to themselves as a researcher comes into the field, questions like, is her spirit clear? Does he have a good heart? What other baggage are they carrying? Are they useful to us? Can they fix up our generator? Can they actually do anything? 
so I think always asking ourselves is these questions of what do we bring and what can we do um, to work in, in collaboration and, and help our participants get something out of the research. And in this project, I think it was particularly hard. There was no scope to feed anything back to the students themselves. We, I really did feel in this project, like we went in, took the knowledge of the young refugee background people, went out, analysed it, and they never got anything fed back at all to the students. The schools did and the, the sector did, but not the students. But then as I reflect on that, I think what we did enable was, um, for example, one student was identified as at risk of not completing her SACE because some of some policy barriers basically in the SACE department. And through a round table that we facilitated, the SACE board actually went out to this student school um, and made some special allowances and exemptions and that student did complete her school. So while we didn't feed back and enable benefits to particular individual participants. There was kind of a general benefit. Um, and we also were able to um, then um, implement, some, or the SACE board, I should say, implemented some changes to policies as a result of our research that we hope will have some positive, in, um, some positive impacts for this group of students as well. How am I going for time, Heidi? I feel like... I got time to touch on the last project. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Please do keep going. It's super, super interesting. Keep going. All right. Thank <laughs> you. Okay, so the third project then, um, and for me in a way, this is the one that feels the most unethical. Um, so I'll highlight a little bit more why I think that was the case. So this is the project that I undertook um, while at the University of Glasgow. Uh, and it was a project called Engaging Syrian Background Students and Families in Schooling in Glasgow. And to give you some context, I had a four month visiting fellowship. Um, I was over there with my family of five. Um, so by the time I got there, found my feet in the university, got access to all the systems, found out what applying for ethics entailed. Um, and to be fair, the ethics was very good. Um, it was the summer holidays, but the ethics application, unlike ours, I think it was two or three pages of a written document, very clear. Um, quite short, sharp and shiny, and it came back very promptly. I also had to get ethics approval from uh, the, the Glasgow City Council, who's the education body there, um, which in Australia, in our Department of Education, would probably take at least eight to 12 weeks, um, but theirs was back very promptly as well. But nonetheless, by the time I'd done all of those kind of procedural elements, I didn't have an awful lot of time to get out into the field and do the relationship building that I like to do in underpinning the research. So um, what I did in terms of methodology or methods was individual interviews with five education staff, so teachers, policy makers and school leaders, um, and then fo a focus group with three mothers. I had initially just planned to do uh, two focus groups, one with the women and one with men. Um, and this was done through a Syrian community group at a community centre that I had got involved with. Um, but when I started doing, I did the first focus group um, and a couple of the mothers came up to me afterwards and said, we don't want to talk to you like this. We want to talk to you with our husbands. We want to talk in a family unit rather than as a focus group. So I changed that then and ended up doing uh, interviews with three mother and father pairs as well. So in total, I interviewed eight Syrian parents. Um, but to do this, again, you know, I wanted to build the community and the reciprocal kind of relationship. So I didn't just want to rock in and say, here, I want six Syrian parents or eight Syrian parents to talk to. So although I was only there for a short time, I started my journey to engaging with the community. And I think this kind of came from a point of my research with the Dinka community. I had such deep knowledge of the community from my many years of involvement, and I felt really blind, I guess, and, and really unknowledgeable coming to the Syrian community where I knew so little of, um, you know, many aspects of, of, of Syrian life, Syrian families, Syrian communities, Syrian displacement. Um, so I, I got involved with a, um, an English, pre, pre, predominantly English language teaching group that ran, but it was really a community gathering. The, the Syrian community came together and they would have um, meals and coffees and things and there'd be a little bit of English teaching on the side. Um, so I got involved volunteering with that just to build rapport. And that took so long that I ended up with two weeks to actually try and get these focus groups and the interviews done. And the, the group only ran 
um, weekly. And so the pressure was really on at that point to try and collect the data. Um, so I, I felt really pressured then in that end it, to then just make it happen. I wasn't able to be as responsive and adaptive to the community um, as, as I would like to have been. Um, and then I really felt like I did, because I did it in the two last two weeks of my visit, I really did feel like I just took their interview data and, and knowledge and left. Um, and I did take a farewell cake in my last week to try and show my appreciation, but it kind of got lost in the busyness. So I didn't, it didn't come out as a reciprocal giving back as I, I thought it might come back as. Um, and then I had really very little way to feed back to that community group what the findings were of my research. So I, I wrote a book chapter um, and usually I would want to run those ideas through with people within the community, but there was no scope to do that. So I sent that book chapter to the community centre as they were the only contact I had, but I don't even know whether that reached the participants at all. So um, for me, I think that that has been you know, a learning for me of what I find important and ethical in a research from that in a research project from that micro ethics perspective. Um, I sit really uncomfortably with extracting research, extracting data, and leaving without a reciprocal relationship in any way. Um, so I think, yeah, that that's the main points that I wanted to make. So well, I look forward to your questions and your thoughts. Thank you so much, Mel. That was really, really interesting. And yeah, really great examples and really great to hear your reflections on, on what worked and what didn't work so well. So thank you so much. Um, I wonder if we can all briefly unmute ourselves once more and give Mel a round of applause. If we can make this happen, I'll make a start. Okay, the thought was there, Mel. <laughs> yeah, and I'll stop my share so that we can all see each other again. <laughs> the as well. best applause you've ever received, but it, the thought was there. So we'll hand over to David. Um, and David, you should be able to share your screen as well. And if you can also just unmute yourself. The, is that screen coming up? Yeah, terrific. Yeah, thanks very much. Okay, it's not coming up on my screen. Okay. Well, thank you, Mel, um, for your presentation and for everybody here. Certainly, um, I'll be touching on some things that Mel has uh, already um, looked at as well in, in the process for, for what I'm going to be sharing about. Just a little bit about myself. Um, so my work with refugees uh, has actually in the end largely revolved around one particular community, which is the Hazara Afghan community here in Australia. It originally um, started out by looking at uh, non-European migration into regional and rural Australia, which is a a growing phenomena that um, many have not been aware of, although we are increasingly becoming so. And it just so happened that the largest non-European community in the country town that I was looking at were Hazara humanitarian background refugees. Uh, and so my interest in this particular project was looking at the ways in which local communities, local rural communities, and newer migrant uh, communities, and in, in this case, uh, those from a refugee background, how did they engage with one another? Uh, what were uh, opportunities for interactions? And in what ways did these provide um, opportunities for inclusion and exclusion in the community? And it, it was challenging in the different ways in, in, in the kinds of intercultural encounters that took place between these communities. This led to another project that I was involved with where I looked at the Hazara 
community and, and trying to uh, explore the ways in which they uh, negotiated their multiple sense of identities, recognizing that uh, we all bring many things to who we are. And with the Hazara community, I was interested in the way, particularly those who are now permanent residents or citizens, explored what it meant for them to be Hazara, what it meant for them to be Afghan, what it meant to be Muslim or not, what, what it meant to them to be uh, Australian, and what it meant to them to be from a refugee background, and the way they negotiated uh, and encountered these identities in their life experience. I'm presently uh, working on a couple of research projects. One is looking at the social, cultural, and economic impact that those migrants from a refugee background have on local communities. And the focus of this research is that migrants are more than um, economic contributors, which is the more common way that we try to evaluate uh, the role or involvement of refugees in local communities. And this project is trying to look at the social, cultural and economic ways, so that people engage in all kinds of ways beyond the economic. Um, and how can we uh, view that? And it, again, it's been looking at the Hazara community in a particular um, uh, local government council area here in England. I'm also involved in another project, um, draw, looking at the ways, uh, the aspirational uh, focus of parents from a refugee background whose children are doing well in school. And this is led by a colleague at UniSA. And it's just trying to understand what are those things that parents bring to support children that do well and at the same time, what are the things that we can learn from the students themselves that have helped them? So these are some of the kind of projects that I've been involved with um, in this space now. Let me get my... Just trying to get my PowerPoint to go down. So I'm going to look at a couple of different questions that we were asked to address uh, and uh, I think it's um, Im important the first one we want to look at is the issue of positionality of the researcher I think and Mel's brought this up but you know as we go into some of these questions um, we recognize, uh, as Siva has commented, research on refugee populations poses some of the most difficult ethical and methodological, methodological challenges in the field of human research. They are marginalized communities, and it's important that we recognize that there are issues that we need to think about consciously and intentionally. And a word that Mel used, which I will continue to use in my presentation uh, reflexively uh, as we try to understand them. This particular quote uh, from Hagman, um, I think really highlights this and this begins to make us really think about the role of refugees as those who are the focus of our research. In this particular quote, Hagman says, in particular refugees report that they've provided information in good faith, seeing this as part of a relationship with researchers that might benefit their condition, only to find out that their information is treated like a commodity. This is illustrated by the words of one refugee, which I've underlined, we are really fed up with people just coming and stealing our stories, taking our photos, and we never get anything back, not even a copy of the report. There is a sense that they have been used by researchers. So there are certainly challenges. Um, and uh, I'll touch a little bit on this towards the end of my presentation uh, in regards to how we view the role of those from a refugee background who are our participants. But the challenge uh, ethic, ethic, ethically and methodologically is that we do not just go in and steal and take uh, as if the data or the participants uh, are numbers in a project for us 
um, to gain from, to help with our research and publication of knowledge. But really the focus on refugees, uh, those from a refugee background as uh, people who need to be valued uh, in all kinds of different ways. Um, and certainly not as uh, another project for us as researchers to get engaged in, in building our own profile and knowledge in the particular area that we want to be involved in. Um, so I've been thinking a lot more about the positionality of the researcher in research and in the particular research project that I mentioned that I'm involved in at the moment, looking at the social, cultural and economic contributions of those from a refugee background to local communities. I've really been thinking this uh, a lot more. And of course, it begins by asking ourselves some questions. What do we as a researcher bring to our research? And it again re requires some level of reflexivity as we begin to think not just that I'm a researcher, I've got, uh, and I'm going to go and look at this particular group, but we all bring something. Um, what is it that we bring uh, from an academic or discipline perspective? What is the research knowledge or background that uh, is impinging on the way that we are going to understand the research that we're engaged with? We have a positionality uh, around that. And we have certain experiences around either the knowledge that we've gained through our studies or perhaps the experience we've already had doing research. And some of us would have had more than um, perhaps one opportunity to research with those from a refugee background. And of course, questions about our gender, our age, our ethnicity, um, and then when we are looking at our research teams, what, what, is, what is it that we each bring in our research team? So with the particular project that I'm involved with, I have a colleague who uh, from a discipline of cultural studies, I have another colleague in the discipline of education, um, myself uh, as a sociologist, another as an economist, um, and another who has um, a, a sociology background as well. But we bring something to it. And I think part of one of the things that I recognized in my, my own perspective of what um, my understanding of in, uh, the, way, the way I was going to engage with those from a refugee background is the importance of understanding the lived experience that people have around their own experiences. And this comes out of uh, my own work in multiculturalism around something called everyday multiculturalism, which Amanda Wise uh, and others have particularly looked at. And that is while policies and the macro affect people's lives in tangible ways, uh, it's the ways in which people uh, experience that in everyday ways. Um, and we bring life experience. Uh, and it's important to ask these questions because it, it, it will impact in one way or another on our work with refugees. So one of the things, uh, the first time I applied for an ARC project, I was a, a young researcher on somebody else's uh, application and it was, um, uh, it was rejected one of the, uh, reviewers comments was that um, your white middle-aged men um, engaged in research and they found it uh, inappropriate. Um, but one of the things that uh, that kind of statement, I will kind of get into how I responded to that particular statement at this point, but uh, it made me reflect about myself and I'm interested for you as in your own work, what is it that you bring to your research among re refugees that perhaps is beneficial to you? I represent some of those characteristics that sometimes uh, can be dismissed in academic 
circles around my involvement in perhaps this kind of research. But I'm more than my age and my, um, you know, my, uh, my cultural background. And one of the things that I bring to my research is living for 20 or 30 years in uh, South Asia and Central Asia and growing up in Papua New Guinea. My whole life experience from childhood through my adult life has been engaging with marginal communities, with uh, cultural communities very different from my own. And what I brought to my work among the Hazara was the fact that I had lived and traveled into Afghanistan, uh, into parts of Afghanistan like Quetta, which is a, one of the main cities that many Hazara have had to pass through. And so my own engagement with the Hazara community was also my life experience and my awareness where they have come from. And that had provided opportunities of engagement, particularly in building relationship. And of course, um, these kinds of questions that we all bring have their strengths uh, and their limitations. And it's our awareness of what they are. We can never completely um, overcome some of those issues. Um, but we can be aware of them and try to think through the steps that we can take that perhaps uh, will be a, a resource to be that will be positively used in our research and perhaps where they are, uh, can be a, a limitation, what we can do uh, to address that. And of course, uh, there are issues that Mel also touched on issues about um, vulnerability, a power imbalance, and uh, a lack of a lack of trust. And these all are particularly important when we are looking at um, those from a refugee background. So Block, Riggs, and Haslam, for instance, uh, identify three categories of vulnerability that need to be considered. The first is what they call consent-based vulnerability. That is where challenges arise in ensuring informed and voluntary consent. Uh, Risk-based vulnerability relating to risk or harm associated with the research and justice-based vulnerability where the research does not benefit the participants or society more broadly. And these, um, are really important questions to be asking when we are engaging with those from a refugee background. Are they able to um, have the information and are able to give appropriate consent? Have we thought through the risks associated with them? Um, and uh, are they going to benefit uh, appropriately? Um, and is society going to benefit? And I think this is really an important question. Um, which uh, I'll touch on a little bit more uh, later around benefit. And of course, the questions we raised, some have raised about the issues of vulnerability is um, some have questioned whether we should be working with, uh, engaging with research among refugees. And certainly uh, refugees, the, the earlier quote I gave, um, have been in, case, in some cases over-researched I, I'm aware that in some places, if that there are, that uh, when university researchers want to research among the refugee community, some uh, resource providers who have been serving and working with refugees are actively discouraging or discouraging research because of um, the fact that there is just been so much research um, with them. But, um, but it's recognizing also issues of trauma as a potential uh, limitation. Uh, however, uh, others have spoken of the fact that the participants' agency, voluntary participation, and fully informed consent uh, can be beneficial to the process. The potential vulnerability of former refugees is not a reason not to invite them to participate as interview participants. However, these challenges need to be acknowledged and appropriately addressed during all stages of the research process. So vulnerability doesn't um, not include refugees, 
uh, or those from a refugee background, but it does mean that we need to acknowledge that they have challenges uh, associated with them and that we take these into account at different stages um, of, of the research. I think one of the other comments I just want to make here is that, of course, there is no such thing as a kind of homogenous refugee. They all come from very different backgrounds, various um, ways uh, in terms of the, con the conflict or context in which they became a refugee or asylum seeker, their journey here, their own particular journey through the process of um, either through detention or various forms of settlement. And uh, so there are what I would call a kind of crisis, non-crisis continuum of involvement. If I'm going to be researching refugees who have been living for 10 years in Australia and Australian citizens, uh, I need to be aware of issues, but they're going to be different than those if I'm seeking to research refugees in a place of crisis and conflict itself. And it's important to think through what, might, what that might involve. What is important is that we need to build trust. Um, and along with this is an awareness um, that many of them have experienced mistrust through their refugee experience. One of the things that will um, often come up, and certainly when I was doing uh, my research in a regional area, was the issue of who would want to participate in the research. And those refugees have had different experiences of trust and mistrust with authorities. You as a researcher reflect one authority. Um, and, and of course, it depends in an Australian context on what level of visa status or residential status they have. Are they still on a bridging or CHEV visa? Are they a permanent resident? Are they an Australian citizen? Um, and certainly those who are still processing will be likely to be more reluctant to engage with the research process. And so it's vital that we as researchers um, build trust both at the beginning uh, and throughout our, uh, our research. I'm just aware of the time here, Heidi, so I'm gonna move on here a little bit. Researchers need to be able to describe the cultural and linguistic context for their research. Don't just plunge in. I think this is a reminder that we try to understand the community that we're involved in before we engage. Um, and that might be through building relationships with those from the same community. It's asking and engaging with uh, cultural and resource providers. And one of the great things about university research that we've been encouraged to engage with community partners in our research. So it's not just academics going and doing our research, but we're actually partnering with those within the community. And the project that I'm on at the moment with my other colleagues um, has uh, got a community partner, the Multicultural Communities Council of South Australia. And a key staff uh, on this, in, in this, with this industry partner has years of engagement with refugee and migrant background communities, um, extensive engagement with the Hazara community, and they have been fantastic in providing both cultural insights and refugee background insights into how we engage with the community. And as we've talked together about how we're going to do the research, uh, they have been very good at telling us, yes, you're, that's the right approach, and uh, when we're not doing it, not to do that. But I think one of the things that really helped in this was uh, understanding the relational aspect of moving forward into engaging with refugee communities. Uh, Mel's already touched on procedural ethics um, uh, and microethics. So I'm not going to touch too much on this, except to say that this is a process that we need to be reflecting on right throughout our engagement with refugee, uh, with the refugee participants that we're involved with uh, and reflecting on that. Uh, how do we engage with 
refugees will, and this has come up a bit earlier again, but we need to be researching with refugees, not um, a focus of, of those from a refugee background as objects of our research. Um, I guess it's kind of taking a, a researcher gaze uh, away um, and the focus increasingly is around these kind of relational approaches to our engagement. Uh, Mackenzie et al. speak about um, we need to move away from viewing um, participants um, as subjects of research to participants in the research. To move uh, not so much focusing on harm minimization, but on reciprocal benefit to the communities. And moving from informed consent to the promotion of autonomy. In what ways is our research going to enhance their own capacity uh, and ability? Uh, how are they going to uh, benefit and grow from this? Um, and to be moving away from a researcher directed research to participant and community engaged research. And one of the ways this, um, I mean, this builds on the idea that refugees are the experts of their own experience, that we are learning from them uh, is, is a much, is a, a huge part of the process of, of the research that we are doing. Uh, and it's collaborative and participatory. And I think uh, one of the things that was really important in the res recent research project was uh, that if we're going to do this research, looking at the ways in which those from a refugee background, uh, impacting and engaging with their local communities, then we needed to find ways to be invited in and to be introduced by the community. And this took some time. So it's identifying those keys. Sometimes, um, you know, they might be gatekeepers, people of influence in the community, or they might be people who have strong relationships that introduce you into the community uh, by the community. And this, the problem we sometimes have with our researchers, we're often time bound. We need to gather our data. Uh, and yet at the same time, if we want effective knowledge that we're going to gain, then we need to do so relationally. And as much as possible, building on a participatory method where we are actually uh, engaging with our refugee background participants uh, and that they become inf not just informants, but collaborators with the research. Uh, how are we going for time? Um, Heidi? You've got time still, David. Please keep going. Okay. Thank you. And this, so this re reflects a little bit on access to and with the community. Um, so being introduced into a community by the community, it takes time to build those relationships uh, and they become key to advising and linking us into the community. But I think one of the things that I found um, is also an awareness that our communities are again not homogenous and there are different often different groups within the communities and you find yourself um, thinking that you are being introduced in the community when you're actually being introduced to a particular part of that community sometimes because there are conflicts so you're actually engaging with one part but not necessarily with the other and uh, so it's awareness of the fact that there are uh, differences within that. And what's helped us with a particular project is our community, um, the person from our community partner who has had extensive relationship has been able to help us and guide us through, through that process of understanding. Um, and also helping us to be able to uh, interact with different people from different parts of the community. Um, I think the other thing that I'm interested in with, with refugee research um, and research more generally is what I've called fly in, fly out research. And this is one of the ethical challenges we have as researchers, often because we are limited by our financing, 
our budget, the time constraints that we have. But uh, I'm really wanting to, to push uh, in, a, in a stronger way our need to, even if we're not uh, a fly in, fly out, what does that mean? That means we often go into a community, we do our research within a week or two weeks, we gather our interviews and our data, and then we leave again. And we have little, uh, we don't have uh, uh, the kind of time we really want in building the relationships and we often don't have ongoing relationships afterwards. And this is a great struggle. I don't know if we will ever find a, a good answer for, except uh, I think we've, we need to find ways to continue to build. And one of the things that's helped me with my research in the country town with both the local community and the refugee community is I found ways to keep building on my research project. I ended up having three research projects that meant that I could keep going back to the local community um, and keep building on the relationships that I've uh, had in the different projects and being able to keep back, giving back into uh, their own situation. Um, and I'm not sure, I don't have the answer to this, except if we can build longevity into our, into our research, I think it would build greater trust within both the refugee community that we're engaged with, as well as the local communities in which they are a part of. Uh, and I think that is going to be really important. Uh, how will the run of research benefit refugee communities? Um, I think my, uh, Mel has already touched on the various ways that um, this has impacted her own research, but I think this is a research that I've been asked every time I talk about working with refugees and um, and I think it's a question that we need to uh, that needs to drive our research again from the beginning during the research and after the research and that is how is what we are going to do going to benefit um, and the challenge is, is if we cannot identify ways in which our research is going to benefit refugees and their communities then we need to question whether we should be doing the research Uh, and one of the questions I was thinking of reflecting in relationship to this was the issue about ethics. I mean, our university asks us that question in our, you know, the application for ethics, how is this going to benefit the community? And I realized that this is a question I can answer in some ways at the beginning, but I need to keep asking and asking with the community that we're involved with. And one of the questions I've been bringing up with my our participants is how do you want this research to benefit you? So it's not just the researcher coming up with ideas about ways in which they can benefit them, but engaging with your participants and actively asking them, uh, asking them how they would like to benefit. And one of the ways we've talked about is um, perhaps um, uh, ways in which we not just we can have uh, opportunities to communicate with the local community, uh, the refugee, uh, in this case the Hazara community, ways in which they've talked about can we use that to promote our community in the media. I'm not sure how we're going to do that but there are ways in which I don't want to simply go to the media if that is an opportunity for the that could benefit them, particularly looking at the positive contribution of refugees, but talking and actively engaging with them in the process of how this is going to benefit uh, and them and the way they would like it to benefit. So I really just want to um, probably leave it uh, at this point, just looking at asking the, the questions that we need to ask at the beginning, during, uh, and after that process. I have a couple of other points that, um, and I think that the, the biggest point, this is just a couple of points that actually Mel brought up as well regarding procedural ethics and microethics. And I think that the, the biggest kind of thing that I think I want to leave you with is 
the importance of reflexivity, that we think intentionally about our role and engagement in the research process. But this is not just something we do at the beginning, but we do during and after the research. And having a research team is fantastic because uh, we've tried to make this an intentional part of our uh, research meetings where we actually try to reflect on what we are actually engaging and learning through the process and what we need to change as we go about doing it. Uh, but I think I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. That was super, super interesting. And I really enjoyed hearing what you said about positionality and what you said about reflexivity and also what you said about how to work with refugee communities and how we can benefit them. So thank you very much for um, sharing your knowledge with us and for your time today. And if we can once more very briefly unmute ourselves and give David a round of applause. Um, and so, David, can you stop your screen sharing? Yes, I'll just do that. Thank you. So the chat is already on fire. So everyone is super, super keen to start asking questions and to join into the conversation. So we have got plenty of time left for our Q&A session. So how we want to do this is if we can please all stay muted other than Mel and David. And if you would like to ask a question, just um, you can even just put a little star into the chat box like I'm doing it right now, or I sent this to Sarah privately. So you can put a little star in the chat box. So I know that you would like to um, ask a question, um, but we already had a comment that I would like to come back to and I hope I say the name right, and I'm very sorry if I don't. Kula, Kula Dal, I hope I say this right. You made a comment about your own experience of being from a refugee background and your experience of being a research participant. I wonder if you're happy to share your experience and maybe direct it as a question to Mel and David, and then we also then um, give the opportunity to everyone else to ask some questions. Yeah, hi everyone. Hello. Hi. Yeah, so um, I often get asked by panel members and colleagues about my position that I was also a refugee. I think I still am. And I'm also working with refugees coming from my own country, and I don't want to mention the name. Uh, so after I got my master's degree here in Australia, I was an asylum seeker. And even when I reflect back in the time, I'm not even familiar with these terms. What is an asylum seeker? What is a refugee? Anyway, so I was in an interview with um, someone from the Red Cross claiming that they will help me with something. And she introduced me to another researcher, to a researcher, and she said, uh, this researcher is going to sit and record your answers. And she didn't even explain, that she didn't even get my consent. And that researcher just sat down, recorded my questions, and I still remember this incident. And I, I still feel violated. Um, so I felt to research, literally. I felt that I'm under examination. And uh, now that I am a researcher, I often read some papers written about the women who are coming from my country, the refugees. And Honestly, I dislike uh, the misrepresentation of us and that some claim just because they lived two years or four years in that, under that oppressive regime, they claim that they are an insider. But you're not an insider because the laws do not apply to you, even if you lived in that country for 10 years. Um, yes, so I think sometimes I'm in a mission of correcting the misinformation about us. And sometimes I question myself and my position that I'm an insider. I'm not just an insider. I'm not, that, I'm not just coming from that country. Um, I also have the same experience as my uh, participants. So what are the questions you think I should ask myself to help me in, in, in terms of, uh, with regards to ethics? Yeah, and I just wanted to share my experience of being researched myself. Thanks very much. And I think that's very interesting to hear that from you. Thank you for sharing that. And we'll hand over to Melo to David, if you would like to respond. Yeah, I think, thank, thank you for sharing your experience. And 
I think that's something I'm always really conscious of is, um, yeah, that, that experience of feeling violated and, and that, the fact that you still feel violated when you f read a research paper about, basically about yourself, someone else writing their knowledge of yourself. And I think it's a, a long legacy of colonial knowledge of the other is really what, what you're speaking about. And, and, and refugee research is, is this another form of knowledge of the other. It's just another way of othering um, groups of people. Um, so I think that's where decolonial research approaches are really helpful. Um, and those kinds of reflexive ways of thinking about your own positionality. Now talking to, uh, to you as a researcher um, of yourself and your own people, uh, being able to reflect on your own positionality in your community um, and your experience and how that informs your understanding of other women or other people's experience. Because uh, we all bring our own sets of knowledges to how we understand the situation. So I think for you, um, you know, if, if you're not already familiar with some of the uh, decolonial research approaches like Linda Tihuai Smith and, and many, many others who I think it's now 20 years since her book was first released. So um, there's been a plethora of, of research on those kind of decolonial approaches. Um, and I, I know there are some, I can't think of the authors off the top of my head, but people who are talking about decolonial methodologies in refugee research specifically, um, which may be of use to you. Yeah, and I think uh, highlights, I think it's, um, I, I, uh, I guess I have lots of different things going through my mind in terms of what you said, and I'm certainly, um, it's not nice to feel that you've been misrepresented and violated when researchers um, haven't taken the time, um, particularly in informing and, and gaining appropriate consent from those that we're engaged with. Um, and I think your, your, your points really highlight the importance that um, we as researchers need to really take so much care and to be intentional that what we're engaged with needs to have that ethical uh, care uh, ethics of care in the way we engage with people because um, you know violation and misrepresentation can so easily happen and um, being aware of our positionality hopefully maybe it doesn't take it away completely but it hopefully helps us by taking that intentional time to avoid um, as much as possible, that kind of violation and misrepresentation that you've referred to. And I think one of the things that you've, you've talked about um, in terms of the questions to ask yourself is you bring all kinds of things into, um, that are strengths into your role as a researcher from somebody from this background. And I think it's uh, affirming those things um, but being aware and asking yourself, what, so what are the strengths and what are the limitations that I have as I, well, that I, from my context and my experience that I bring into the research? Um, and of course, then the question is, is that research also among those from a refugee or asylum seeker background, or is it another marginalized community, or is it in a different context? Uh, but being reflexive uh, about that. One of the other things that you raised um, about you now yourself being an academic researcher, uh, and I've been challenged more recently um, as I've had another opportunity to get some funding to do some more research among refugees in country towns, was to put in my budget uh, the opportunity to add a researcher from that background into the research team to do some of that field research. So that uh, it's recognizing that that needs to be valued and we need to find ways to promote and facilitate that as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your responses. 
Thank you. Um, Marzia, I think, was the next person who had a question. Then we come to Anna Maria. So, Marzia, if you would, would like to ask your question. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Uh, thank you for this speech. And I'm a PhD student as well, and I'm Iranian. So uh, my PhD project is on uh, female migrants from Farsi-speaking countries, uh, both uh, Afghanistan and Iran. And uh, I choose uh, that uh, autoethnography method for my research. Uh, so my question is that for uh, ethics committee, uh, for getting the permission and, and uh, how how I can explain my method because it's a kind of method that you engage with the participants uh, with their lives and um, how how I can explain my method to get the permission from ethics committee and that's it thank you, thank you. I'd be happy to share my um, ethics application for my PhD with you, Marzia, because I, you know, as someone who's married into the community and used autoethnographic approaches, I contended with some of the same questions. Um, so that may be of assistance to you if you'd like. Maybe if you can send me an email and I can um, share oh, that. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Thanks, Mel. I, I haven't. Um, engaged with autoethnography myself. So I, I think my own encouragement would be, Marzia, to also uh, read um, around autoethnography auto in its context within qualitative research. And part of presenting your case to ethics committees is to show and to demonstrate that this is an acknowledged uh, form of research and to be able to place it within the context uh, of, uh, of, of the literature around it. So uh, I think being able to kind of qualify that with, within that context will help. And it, I think Mel has got some other more practical experience mm -hmm. to be able to share with you on that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Question. Anna Maria, you had a question that you wanted to ask? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. I have a question. Thank you for your presentation. I work at the Institute for Children Trauma Assistance and Rehabilitation Service in Adelaide, STARS. Um, I just have a question and some comments. Uh, Melanie, I think you mentioned that a decolonial perspective, uh, I think a decolonial perspective goes beyond recognizing the power imbalances. I think the question that brings I think a decolonial perspective is very important because a decolonial perspective, uh, what it um, implies is um, decentering the conversation and the epistemologies Western. What it says basically is that there are many um, people's lives acknowledges epistemologies that have been subsumed under one um, particular perspective, which is Western. So the question here is then <laughs> research do not happen in a vacuum. Research, especially from universities, are inserted in these um, Western neoliberal economies. So when you are applying for a research grant, you have to fulfill certain requirements. Now, how do you move that to actually changing the terms of conversations? Who are the ones creating the stories in a research? Ultimately, who has the power to talk and in which language? So my question is, because I find the language of insider, outsider, in within a relational ethics contradictory. In a relational approach, you don't have insider, outsider. So how do you conceive relational ethics? That's my question. I 
I guess there was lots of things to respond to in that. I'll, I'll start at the tail end. Um, I think my use of the insider outsider kind of continuum, the question then would be, you know, insider outsider in relation to what? So in a, if you're going within a relational ethic, yes, you're always going to be in relation to your participants. That's the idea of my, you know, my idea was to have a relational ethic of, through friendship with my participants. However, that doesn't negate the, what I refer to as this kind of negotiation along this spectrum of insider outsiderness, both in relation to being a Dinka woman or a Dinka wife, in relation to being an insider, in relation to the research, uh, sorry, in relation to being a, an Australian citizen, um, in relation to the research relationship, um, the person, there's always the person doing the research and the, the objects of the research, I think to get beyond that is what's essential, the, the major challenge in, in decolonizing research approaches. There is always a group or a person or um, a particular object of research. Now we can rename that however we want to, um, and one of the ways I've tried to get beyond that in, in more recent research is, so I, I talked about the African Australian Employment Seeking Project that we've been doing recently. Um, and I became really conscious of being the white woman who goes in and I can, I, I will go into a focus group and say, oh, you know, I'm married to an African, so I understand, but it's not the same as someone who walks down the street every day whose black skin identifies them in a particular way. Um, so what I did in that project was employ three research assistants um, from African countries themselves to work to navigate those relationships in a different way and bring out or enable to be heard those voices that and those epistemologies. So one of the key findings from my PhD was the relational epistemology, which in, in the Dinka language is called Cheng, um, similar to Ubuntu, um, and that, that sense of I'm only a person because of my relations with other people. That was what underpinned the way the, the Dinka women were in every context. So it took me four years of a PhD study and 10 years of living together with this community to be able to begin to get an insight into that. And I end my PhD um, with a reflection of walking into a place in South Africa with the Ubuntu saying, and, and I've just spent two months in South Sudan and I sort of patted myself on the back and thought, oh, I'm really starting to get the hang of this relational way of being. And my husband walked in and, and read the same sign and, and turned around and said to me, that's what you don't get implying that you know it, you just don't get this relational way of being so I, I think my recognition then is that my entire lifetime plus the history of western epistemologies and western knowledges have colonized my knowledge in a way that i actually can't really hear the way say a an, an african heritage or an african research assistant can hear the focus groups and the interviews of participants from their background. But it's about how we talk through those um, epistemological, and I would say even ontological contradictions, and how we can learn from and actually hear those knowledges is what, I think that's where we're at now in trying to decolonize the many years of formal Western knowledges that have made unhearable um, some of these other knowledges and ways of being. Do you want to add to it, David? Um, look, I don't have too much more to add um, at this point, except that, um, you know, the kinds of things that you've raised, Anna Maria, are just so important for us. Um, and the issues of the insider or outsider, I think, are really a reflection of um, the fact that we have various relational experiences with the people that we're engaged with and we come to it on a continuum of, of understanding 
but the dangers that we have is when we think we know when we don't know. And I think Mel has just touched on that. Uh, and sometimes we are just so blind to what we bring, you know, our epistemologies, our ontologies, our, the way we think and see things. So often we are just blind to it until we have opportunities to see and recognize, perhaps not fully. And the, you know, the insights that Mel's husband gave to her in that moment um, are really important. And the comments that you're raising are the questions that we need to be engaged with um, throughout our research and the need to engage with one another uh, on them are really important if we are going to move forward um, in these areas. Thank you. We had a question from Sarah. So Sarah was joining us from Canada, so she unfortunately had to leave. I think it was way past her bedtime. Um, but before she left, she posted the question and she said she would come back and listen to the recording. So we still ask her question um, and we'll make sure that she gets her answer. Um, so she asked, I'm just wondering if the panel have any advice about building relationships with communities and participants in the online sense? While taking the time to build relationships with communities and people in person is the ideal, this is not possible due to the global pandemic. What advice can you give about building trust and taking the time to get to know people virtually? Can you highlight some of the potential ethical issues that may arise in this context? So it's a, probably a new space for everyone, but Mel and David, if you've got any thoughts on that. I'd say it's, it's not something that I have given too much consideration to in this, until this year. Um, either. I know some colleagues at um, the University of Glasgow have been working with um, people living in the Gaza Strip um, over quite a prolonged period now. Um, so they, if anyone I know of, and they, they've been working largely virtually because of barriers to getting visas and travel and things like that. Um, so they, if anyone I know, have, have probably thought of this more than, than I can um, pass on the name. So the, the main person that's been working with them is uh, Giovanna Facetta, um, but also Alison Phipps, if you look up her work, um, you'll, and, and the Glasgow Refugee Asylum Migration Network, um, you'll be able to find some links to some of the work that they've done um, through, through virtual type forums. I guess I, I wouldn't mind throwing this question. I haven't had a lot um, of engagement online in the way that Sarah, and of course this is COVID-19 and the implications when you're involved in field research and can't access face-to-face. -face. I'm just wondering if there are anybody else in the group who have any experience with, um, you know, building relationships online and, and some of the questions that Sarah Roz uh, have, has risen. Are there any others who've engaged with that space that would like to speak to that? If you want to respond, please feel free to unmute yourself. Hi, it's Lillian here. Uh, yeah, as you said, David, it's COVID-19 and it's a new and emerging situation. Do we are going to um, do the online surveys or interviews and such things. So we have a small project which we are going to use the, um, the telephone and the um, uh, online questionnaire. So it's still very early, so we don't know how it's gonna be. But as of now, we just received an ethics and we've changed from interviewing face to face to interviewing by phone. So the, I think the uh, challenge would be how in the first instance you, we are going to get these people, I uh, mean the participants, and also engaging them will be something which may be very new and maybe novel at this time. Thanks. Yeah. I'm just kind of thinking what you're saying, Lillian, and also reflecting because I'm in one of the projects uh, we're having to look at, suddenly having to do not meeting people face to face, but needing to engage with them. Uh, I, you know, I'm just thinking if, if we're going to engage relationally and if relational form of uh, ethics is going to be important in our research, then I think we need to somehow think through how we can do that in 
the um, initial contact with participants and then in our online engagement. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but perhaps it is taking the time to engage in some form of relational conversation with our participants that might mean we don't get to our uh, actual questions that we want to ask either in the first meeting or later on in our conversations because we take the time to build relationship uh, as in this kind of environment. Uh, and it's obviously got incredible limitations, but I think the importance of recognizing that that is still essential to our research, even if we're going to do this online. Um, absolutely. I don't know the answers to that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's gonna be harder for the new researchers because if you're going to start afresh or you're going to start uh, working with the communities, it will be a bit challenging, but for some of, your, um, of the researchers who are already in the community, it may be a little easier, but still be more difficult to them face to face or having um, to see people in reality. Thank you. And um, we probably have time for one more question. If anyone has a final question that they would like to have answered. Maybe not. <laughs> All right. Let's once more unmute ourselves and have a final round of applause to thank um, Melanie and David. Thank you. So thank you both so much for your time and for sharing your knowledge with us. I think it was yeah so beneficial to hear how both of you approach this topic and you've raised so many important and interesting issues. And thank you also for answering all of our questions. And we do have a gift for you. It was more challenging this time <laughs> because so many shops are closed and we also can't give it to you in person. But we have found something that will come to you via email. Um, because it was only just Easter, um, it is Easter themed. It's not a rabbit, but it may or may not be a chicken. I'm not going to say more than that. <laughs> so I've set it up so it should come to you at around three o'clock to your inbox. Um, and yet yeah, it may or may not be a chicken. So yes, thank you very much again for your time. And for thank your you. And thank you, Heidi, thank for you very work, much. organizing it and, and convening it over the virtual forum. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, yeah. And Thanks. thank you for everybody who's joined in. Uh, that was it's been fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you everyone for being so flexible with with the online format. And um, before we head home, I would like once more to um, very briefly share my screen, um, because this, um, like I've indicated, is not the only event that we're planning. We are planning um, uh, five more events for the rest of the year. They were all meant to be face to face. They will all be Zoom events now. And you see the flyer here. So we've got one in May, one in July, one in August, and one in September. And the May one will be facilitated through Sarah's contacts in um, Canada. And it will be about global partnerships for comparative research. The one in July will be on migration, multiculturalism in a post colonizing land. So I think touching on some of the issues that we've raised today. Then there'll be an August one that, fo that focuses on interdisciplinary disciplinary research, melding methodologies and theories. And then a September one on a sociological approach of migration studies, capital habitus and migration. So we will announce all of them via the um, TASA network and also via um, social media as well. So if you're not yet following TASA, or mem and um, please do um, because then you will stay up to date about those sessions and we'll be super happy um, if you will join us again um, for the next sessions in the coming months so yes thank you so much again for joining us um, and yeah, we look forward to hopefully seeing you again in coming months thank you very much bye thank you very much Heidi thank you, thank you. Awesome. Thank you. bye everyone bye, bye David bye You were amazing, Heidi. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. Thanks for all the support. Of course. Hang on, now that you've said I'm amazing, I'll stop the recording. <laughs> 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 That's not the recording.
morning, I can stop 